comings on in Ukrainian politics, it became clear that Manafort's only viable path was whatever the opposition, the opposite of annexation is. On Fox News this morning, Trump's son Eric suggested that all the attention on Manafort's Russian business dealings were part of the reason why the chairman had to go. I think my father didn't want to be, you know, distracted by, you know, whatever things that, you know, Paul was, was dealing with. And, you know, Paul was amazing. And, uh, you know, he, he helped us get through the, the primary process. He helped us get through the convention. He did a great job with, with the delegates, um, you know. And, uh, you know, now you look at, um, you know, Kellyanne and some of the other people that we're bringing in, and they're, they're absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I think they're going to be the ones that bring us, you know, all the way through November 8th and ultimately get us the, the victory. But, again, my father just didn't want to have the, the distraction looming, um, you know, over the campaign and, quite frankly, looming over all the issues that Hillary's facing right now. If there's anyone who sympathizes with what Manafort is going through right now, it's Corey Lewandowski, Trump's first campaign manager, who was pushed out by Manafort in June. So when Lewandowski went on CNN to talk about the news this morning, he didn't gloat at all about the man who ousted him. At the end of the day, uh, you've got people with, that had a vision for the campaign which did not align with what Donald Trump wanted. It's been widely reported that there has not been a robust ground effort in states like Florida, that that, that had not been laid out yet. You cannot blame the candidate for those things. Those things fall squarely on the staff. Sometimes you have to bring different perspectives in. Sometimes you have to change things, particularly in a campaign that in the last three or four weeks have missed, in my opinion, opportunities to go after Hillary Clinton for the failures of her campaign and to point out those failures. I don't think they've done a good job on that. Or maybe he did glow a little bit. Margaret, what have we learned from the Manafort era and what comes next for Trump? Well, I think the first thing that we learned is that uh, Donald Trump is really hard to rein in. Paul Manafort's a pro. He's worked with Republican presidential candidates for decades now. Uh, he knows how to do this, and he told Trump what he wanted to do, and Trump believed in him, at least at one point. But every time he tried to sort of modulate, moderate, put a stricture, put a teleprompter on it, Trump, you know, was guided by his better instincts. Uh, we learned that. Another thing that we learned is that Paul Manafort's connections uh, with pro-Russian Ukrainian forces were damaging to Trump, particularly in combination with Trump's gaffes or miscues uh, in terms of turning against the Khan family, that Gold Star family, and that Trump is now in a position where they felt that they needed, he felt that he needed to do this in order to salvage his prospects. So Trump is able to fall prey to the same staff problems that a Hillary Clinton or any other traditional candidate would be if your staffers are off doing things they shouldn't be doing and get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, same way Mark Penn did for Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2008 when it was discovered that he's lobbying Certainly. for Columbia. Yeah, I mean, look, Donald Trump wants to focus on Donald Trump. I think we all know that. But in this case in particular, he did not want the focus to become a Paul, about Paul Manafort. Now the question is, is the focus going to stay on Donald Trump and will it stay on Donald Trump in the way that his new team wants it to? But so far, so good. He's, he's managed to uh, moderate his image a little bit with a speech that showed that maybe, you know, there is finally, finally, finally going to be a pivot. It's only 36 hours then, though. Let's keep that in mind. <laughs> Moving along, last night in North Carolina, in his first rally since Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway took the Trump campaign reins, the Donald did something that we've never seen him do as a presidential candidate. Apologize. In a way that only Trump would do. Sometimes, in the heat of debate and speaking on a multitude of issues, you don't choose the right words or you say the wrong thing. I have done that, and believe it or not, I regret it, and I do regret it, particularly where it may have caused personal pain. Too much is at stake for us to be consumed with these issues. But one thing I can promise you this, I will always tell you the truth. There's a word for this kind of thing, one that has been used again and again and again and again to describe the Trump campaign over the past few months, pivoting. 
Donald Trump appears ready to pivot to a more presidential demeanor. Is this the big pivot people were expecting ahead of the November election? Many are calling this the beginning of the Trump pivot to the to the presidential Trump, to the one who brings more people in. We in. keep having this discussion on the couch, I think once a week, if not more often, about how this is it. This is the Trump pivot. This is going to be the day that he focuses on substance. This is the 47th time this, we've done exactly. it. Exactly. And, yeah. I, you know, and I, I'll say to you what I've said last week yeah. and the week before and the month before and six months ago, which is that he's fundamentally incapable of doing that. And yet, Team Trump has again tried to reset this week, rolling out more policy speeches and his first general election TV ad, which touches on immigration and hits the airwaves in four states today. Last night, after Trump's speech, the Clinton campaign put out a statement that said, in part, Quote, that apology tonight is simply a well-written phrase until he tells us which of his many offensive, bullying, and divisive comments he regrets and changes his tune altogether. Josh, Trump has been playing this pivot game before. Have we seen anything to suggest that this time will be different? You never know with Trump, right? This could last 24 hours, it could last 48 hours, and we could be right back to some insane tweet that sends the political media scrambling. But I think it could be a little bit different for a couple of reasons. One, he has decided he's not comfortable with Paul Manafort. He's decided that Manafort's uh, Russian business dealings are hurting him and pushed him out. He's brought in a new team uh, who he's known for a long time. He's known Steve Bannon. He's known Kellyanne Conway. He's comfortable with them. And in speaking to senior Trump officials, uh, they say that Trump realizes he is, really is behind. And he needs to moderate, soften his image, win back some of those voters he's alienated. And the only way he's going to do that is if he acknowledges, look, yes, I've made some mistakes. And I think that was what led to this uh, unexpected and really pretty remarkable concession that Trump made in a speech last but night. But if you're the Clinton campaign, aren't you trying like crazy to goad him and goad him and goad him and goad him just into... Well, I, to Trump? you know, I, I think you are. And, and you saw after announcement that Manafort was leaving, uh, Robbie Moot, Clinton's campaign manager, put out a staff essentially saying, uh, literally saying, hey, this doesn't end the, the strange bromance between uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and Donald Trump. They don't want to let this issue go. And it may not go away, but at least Trump has helped himself a little bit by getting Manafort for out of the fold and stopping this drip, 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 drip story uh, uh, surrounding Manafort that it really hurt Trump's campaign. Uh, I think the main question is how long does it last? Uh, I say uh, after Labor Day, let's uh, <laughs> let's reassess I'll take the, the efforts. Speaking of presidential things, Donald Trump and his running mate Mike Pence today flew to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to tour areas damaged by recent heavy flooding. The Republican nominees first met uh, with first responders and volunteers at a Baptist church this morning. There he is unloading a truck of supplies in his blazer. The campaign was pretty clear that this trip was designed to draw a contrast with President Obama, who has been criticized by some for not interrupting his Martha's Vineyard vacation to visit the disaster region. We should note uh, that the Democratic governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, has said that he'd prefer the president hold off so it does not interrupt recovery efforts. And the White House announced today that Obama will go on Tuesday. Either way, Margaret, these types of visits after natural disasters are uh, part of the gigs for presidents and presidential candidates. So how did Trump do today? Well, you know, he didn't blow it, so that's a good thing for him. He perhaps looked a little bit stiff in his blazer, but he's down there trying. <laughs> But look, there's a couple of things to think about. Number one, John Bell Edwards did say initially that it was too soon for Obama to go. And by extension, you can imagine that his priority number one was probably not to have the Republican presidential nominee down there, you know, stumping for votes. So the question for Trump is twofold. It is number one, um, how does the public in Louisiana respond and how does the nation see it? Do they see it as him being really concerned about people in Louisiana or do they see it as a stunt, as a photo op? Well, I, I, I thought it was interesting. I, obviously, it was a, a stunt and a photo op on one level. I thought, I thought Trump should have, instead of wearing the blazer, maybe had like a denim work shirt and a little Make America Great logo <laughs> printed up on it so he'd look a little more comfortable passing uh, food out to, you know, struggling uh, displaced victims of the flood. But on another level, it was interesting that uh, you know, they, they put this thing together, but they didn't let reporters come along. They didn't let Trump come along. Uh, I was reminded of the movie What About Bob, where Bill Murray is, is talking about, you know, we need to do things in baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. This seemed like a baby step to me for Trump 
in uh, getting out there away from the stadium rallies, away from Fox News, and trying to master the performative elements that are presidential connecting candidates. With people, the visuals of connecting with people, exactly. but no one with a pencil or a tape recorder there to ask him a question that he could mishandle on tape. No chance of blowing it. <laughs> when we come back, both presidential candidates are betting on President Obama. Will he be an asset or a liability for Hillary Clinton in November? We'll talk about that and more when we come right back. Let's check in on President Obama. Recently, there have been a few news events, mostly international, that the White House is not too thrilled about. The picture of a five-year-old pulled from the airstrike rubble reminded the world of the horrors in Syria. And yesterday, the State Department admitted that the cash payment to the U.S. made to Iran was linked to the release of American hostages, reigniting a debate over the definition of the word ransom. It all makes you wonder how Obama's approval rating is doing these days. The president has a high approval rating. His approval rating is so high. He's leaving office, uh, you know, with these uh, highs in the approval yeah. rating. That's right. President Obama's approval rating has soared to a stunning, oh, I guess it's only 53 percent. That's according to the latest Pew poll. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton has been embracing Obama on the campaign trail. And Donald Trump is taking every opportunity to talk about the Obama-Clinton administration days. Josh, will the president be more of an asset or a liability to Clinton in the coming days? I don't think there's going to be any question but that he is going to be a real positive for Clinton. I think one of the remarkable stories about this campaign, if you were to back up 18 months, 24 months, Obama's approval ratings were in the 30s. And when pollsters asked people, do you want the next president to have positions similar to or different than Barack Obama, 75 percent of them said different than Barack Obama. It looked like he was going to be a millstone around the neck of the Hillary Clinton Certainly campaign. In the midterm election, the Democrats don't want to touch him. And, in yet, the and yet, 53 percent in this 
political era is like you know, 53% is the new 80%. It really is, uh, for, for a pair of candidates, you know, upside down favorability ratings, you know, struggling to break 40, 45%, having a 53% in your corner is a real plus. And I think Clinton has recognized that and is embracing Obama as she should. Compared to Clinton herself. Compared to Clinton <laughs> he's, herself. He's who was, doing just fine. And compared to George W. Bush, I mean, I think if you look in the waning months of his administration, nowhere close to 53%. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, the other thing that stood out is at the Democratic convention, there was so much of a, of, of a coming together, not just uh, Barack Obama's speech, but Michelle Obama's speech and the idea that, uh, you know, this is our president. Uh, it, in eight years, we've accomplished great things. We brought the, the, the economy back. I think it's natural, you know, barring uh, an Iraq war calamity like we saw with George W. Bush at the end of a president's tenure that there will be uh, good feelings about him, especially when the contrast is the race you have going on between the two most unpopular major nominees ever run for the presidency. Yeah, agreed. More of a more of an asset than a liability right. at this exactly. point. Exactly. After months of criticism, the Clinton Foundation says it will no longer accept foreign and corporate donations if Hillary Clinton is elected president in November. Bill Clinton broke the news to Foundation staff members yesterday, which also happened to be the day after Donald Trump hired Steve Bannon as his new campaign CEO. Bannon's nonprofit, you'll remember, funded a Hillary-hating book called Clinton Cash, which made national headlines last year and raised questions about potential conflicts of interests between foundation donors and Clinton's work as Secretary of State. Coincidence? Margaret, whether or not this foundation move is a response to Bannon, is there any potency left in the Clinton Cash attacks? Yeah, certainly there is, and this is what the Clintons have been preparing for even before they knew it was going to be Steve Bannon at the controls for months. Look, it's not even Labor Day yet. Once that happens, it's presumably a turning point in ads, and everything from Jennifer Flowers to the Clinton Foundation money is on the table. That's what they've always assumed. When you looked at that early polling back in the uh, primary season when it was still Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton, what many Democrats were bothered by was this kind of shadiness, vagueness, blurring between Clinton Foundation and Secretary of State roles. They know it's a possible well, the, issue. The other thing that struck me about the Manafort uh, exit was, look, the attack, the, the Clinton Foundation attacks are essentially, you took money from shady foreign operators, including, you know, people over there in the, in the Ukraine and in Russia. You can't very well lob those attacks when the campaign chairman in your own campaign uh, is under investigation and, and, and getting uh, hand by political reporters for doing the exact, it was exact same thing. Of destruction, but now Trump's side is. Ex exactly. And after, after Manafort left, I noticed that RNC Chairman Reince Priebus tweeted essentially, it is unacceptable that the Clinton Foundation will continue to accept these foreign donations. Why is it that they didn't just go ahead and cut them off right now? Why wait until after Hillary Clinton's elected president? They should have announced a year ago or six months ago that this was their plan. It's period, it's really paragraph. Remarkable. But you see this again and again and again. You saw it when it came to the email controversy. Uh, what she ultimately comes out and says, she could have just said in the beginning, it would have been a lot less damage. It made life so much easier for everybody. So much easier. Up next, a man with the miter touch. Our friend and colleague Zach Miter joins us next to talk about a new major player in Trump world after these words from our sponsors.
at Bloomberg Politics, like the rest of the political world, have been remapping the constellation of aides, advisors, and associates in Donald Trump's expanding orbit. And we noticed two things, or rather people, suddenly at the center of Trump galaxy. Let's call them Mercer Major and Mercer Minor. Robert Mercer, a New York investor, and his conservative philanthropist daughter, Rebecca, have big time financial ties to Trump's new campaign chiefs. And now, both Mercers are serious players in Trump's presidential bid. With us from New York to talk more about all this is Pulitzer Prize winning Bloomberg journalist, Zachary Miter, who has written a lot about the Mercers over the past year and joins us from New York. Glad hey, to Zach. be here. <laughs> Good to see you. So, Talk to us a little bit about this family. Uh, anything interesting we should know about either one, father or daughter, and, uh, and why do we care? Why does America care? How could it impact the race between now and November? Sure, so let me just tell you a little bit about Robert Mercer, he's, he's the dad. Uh, he, he didn't start out in the world trying to make a ton of money. He was a computer programmer, and he spent the first part of his career trying to figure out how to teach computers to use language. Yeah. Then he, in, in, in his late 40s, he got into the hedge fund world and became staggeringly successful. Now he's got a lot of money and he's putting that to use in politics. Zach, what are some, he seems to have so many tendrils all of a sudden into uh, Steve Bannon, Kellyanne Conway, and now the, the, the head of the Trump campaign. Can you describe what a few of those are? Sure, so uh, Mr. Mercer has kind of focused his spending on maybe the kind of the conservative wing of the Republican Party, the anti-establishment kind of Tea Party elements in the Republican Party. And so two of the people who've been kind of his closest advisors, basically, have been Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway, who are now two of the top people in the Trump campaign. So Bannon was the, the head of Breitbart News, um, and the Mercers, uh, Robert Mercer in two, 2011 actually invested $10 million in Breitbart News when it was going through financial difficulties. As far as we know, he still has that stake. So he's, he's actually kind of in business with Bannon. And Kellyanne Conway is the person that the family turned to to uh, run the, the uh, super PAC that they were, they were operating uh, earlier in the campaign to support Ted Cruz's run for uh, the presidency. So, Zach, early on, Mercer, both the Mercers were all in for Ted Cruz. Uh, they had super PACs. They had all kinds of stuff going on. Have they, have they pivoted pretty smoothly just straight to, to Trump and just, just switched horses in, in, in midstream, as it were? It, it sure seems that way. And not only that, but they've, they seem to have essentially washed their hands of Ted Cruz. After Ted Cruz gave that memorable speech in the Republican convention, where he did not endorse Donald Trump. They put out what I think was their first ever public statement, the Mercers do not talk about their politics. They put out a statement saying essentially he was wrong, he should have endorsed the candidate, we've got to unite the party to defeat Hillary Clinton, and it would be very surprising if they ever send another dollar Ted Cruz's way. Now, this, this, is, this is the family that essentially bankrolled uh, the super PACs supporting him, they spent $13.5 million trying to get Ted Cruz elected president. So it was a stunning reversal, and they've since become uh, strongly strong supporters of Donald Trump. It's probably not great news for Ted Cruz, wouldn't you say? I mean, do, do other uh, Republican uh, donors and, and kind of people who make stuff happen watch the Mercers, and, and are, are, do you think they will be watching them more? To some degree, yes. I mean, um, anybody who spends as much time uh, and as money as the Mercers do, I think people pay attention to them. But there's an important difference between them and some of the other kind of mega donors that you might think of, uh, like, like the Koch brothers, for instance, or Paul Singer. Uh, some donors really try to create a network of, of like-minded people to do projects together and recruit other donors to kind of follow them. The Mercers haven't done as much of that. They haven't kind of created a network of donors behind their, their operations. They're much more kind of doing their own things. Hey, Zach, the Mercers had a super PAC. I believe it was run by Kellyanne Conway that supported Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks ago, after Cruz left the race, they switched it over and turned it into, I believe the name of it is the Crooked Hillary PAC. This is supposed to be a Trump PAC. Does the fact that the Mercers have this super PAC mean that they can legally no longer communicate with Steve Bannon and the people at the top of the Trump campaign? Uh, I mean, the, the law is a little, uh, a little up in the air here, but essentially uh, the purpose of the law is to try to keep someone on the campaign from commu privately communicating 
where they need to run ads or what message they're trying to get out to a super PAC and then have the super PAC uh, follow those instructions. So, so anything that the, the campaign might do that's perceived as giving the super PAC insight into their kind of secret strategy would be a potential uh, legal problem. But, you know, outside of that, there's a lot of things you can do as long as you sort of swear up and down you're not talking about uh, messaging and strategy. Zach, real quickly, uh, Mercer has bankrolled what, what essentially seems to me like a years-long effort to define and attack Hillary Clinton. He donated money to the nonprofit that produced the Clinton cash book. I believe his daughter, uh, Rebecca, was a board member at one point. I, is this really a big kind of victory and vindication for Mercer in his view of how politics should be conducted? Um, I mean, Mercer's always been, uh, he's never been a kind of right down the middle Republican donor. He's always been, uh, I think, um, from talking to people close to him, very much of the view that the, the whole, the whole uh, Washington system is corrupt and, and needs to be utterly uh, reformed, both Republican and Democrat. Okay. And, and so, right, and so Hillary Clinton is, is obviously part of that, but He's also funded a lot of stuff to go after, say, Jeb Bush or some of the more kind of mainstream Republicans. Okay. Zach Miner, thank you. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk with a Washington Post reporter about the latest in Hillary land after this. work because others depend on us. Hillary Clinton gets it. Standing up for families and children has been her life's work. Under her plan, working parents get relief from the cost of child care and a path to debt-free college, equal pay for women, and paid time off to care for family. Building an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top, because we're stronger together. That was Hillary Clinton's newest TV ad, which will start running in seven battleground states. We're shifting gearings with our next guest. It's Ann Guerin, a reporter for the Washington Post who's been covering Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. She joins us here in Washington, D.C. Ann, thanks for coming on the show. Happy to be here. So, you and I are sitting right here in Washington. Hillary Clinton is not. Where is she? 
Hillary Clinton is, we think, um, out on Martha's Vineyard already, where she was planning to be uh, later this weekend, but uh, she ended up going early. It's Bill Clinton's birthday, so we, again, the details are sketchy, but we think she's out there celebrating Bill Clinton's birthday. Yes. For these, was this supposed to be a surprise party? Or was this not supposed to, to come us, out in the public? Yeah, to, yeah. No, we weren't invited. <laughs> no, no, I meant, to, I meant to Bill, but I guess I guess everything's supposed to be a surprise for us. D does it matter the fact that we've, we've got Donald Trump down in Louisiana today? We've seen him doing presidential things. We found out this afternoon that President Obama will be down there on Tuesday doing presidential things. Does that put any pressure on Hillary Clinton to make a trip down to Baton Rouge and show that she, too, is, is capable of this sort of thing and, and on the case? Well, sure. I mean, it, it it obviously just sets up the question if if Trump goes would she go uh, I mean I think she uh, would be leery of of doing so for for fear of um, looking uh, opportunistic and certainly there was criticism of Trump by the Democratic governor uh, for at least the, the possibility that he could interfere uh, with with efforts there or um, you know make a uh, in in the governor's words make it a photo op uh, I mean she would be loath to, to try to do that but certainly it it it, it raises the question. You want to be president of the United States. This is exactly the sort of thing that, that the president of the United States is expected to do, uh, even if it means interrupting your vacation. So would she do it or not? Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, um, I'm struck by the idea that even though Trump would very much like to put the heat on Hillary Clinton, this entire last week has been all about the focus being on Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden were in Scranton earlier this week. We were both there. And uh, even then, again, the news overtaken by Trump, but it's been negative news about Trump, and Clinton has sort of weighed, how much do I just sit back and let him kind of self-destruct? Right. Mean, I mean, that has been uh, a large part of the, the Clinton uh, strategy over the last 10 days or so, is just sort of stay out of his way. So uh, with Bannon and with Kellyanne Conway now, the Clinton campaign is reading this really how. Is this all great news for them? Is it bad news for them? Are they worried? Are they not that worried? Well, I mean, I, I think actually the departure of Manafort, I mean, he was first sidelined and then gone, right? I, I think the initial read from inside Clinton World um, on, on the staff shakeup was, wow, well, that's confirmatory of, you know, things are just really in a giant mess over there. Um, and then, so they thought that was good. Uh, the departure of Manafort is, is a, you know, is a bit of a wild card, right? I mean, he... He was a, a tempering influence, or at least he, he attempted to be, uh, and they really don't know what to expect now. Um, and uh, uncertainty is never a good thing, right? Is there a fear? You know, a guy like Bannon is is so out of left field. He has no campaign experience, and all his involvement in national politics has been with Breitbart News and just these outrageous attacks that would be considered well outside the bounds of what is politically acceptable, you know, a few years ago. Now, I guess anything goes. Uh, is there worry? with Bannon whispering in Trump's ear that Trump could essentially erupt in a way that we've never seen before toward Hillary Clinton. Well, right. That's what I meant. I mean, you know, they, they sort of felt like they had some—they could draw some box as long as, as Manafort was, was in the picture. I mean, it, he wouldn't let Trump do X, right, whatever X is. Um, and and that, those, those lines are basically not there anymore. But, you know, so if you're the Clinton campaign, at least what they're saying in their public posture is to say, this change is nothing. We always expected a nasty gutter campaign, and we're prepared for it. Do you think that they are actually behind the scenes changing their game, stepping up an attack plan, or do you think they'll mostly leave that to the surrogate groups, the third-party groups, correct the record? And does this guarantee a nastier race? Well, I mean, I think— it it, they were not wrong to say from the beginning that they expected there to be a, a bloodbath in September, October, and, in, and into November. That it would be uh, extremely nasty, uh, you know. With and they and they would be ready for anything. I mean, Monica Lewinsky to whatever, right? I mean, they, Hillary Clinton knows in the process of running for office that all of those things are going to come her way. I think what they didn't plan for uh, was the just sort of the 
the complete um, uh, unpredictability and and kind of you know it's it's beyond a question of of how do they respond. It's a question of they have absolutely no idea what they might be hit with on 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 any day, uh, and that you know that throws people off their off their footing. Um, I think there is definitely now a sense w within a lot of the uh, close Clinton advisors that I mean is just buckle up. They they figure that it's going to be extraordinarily nasty uh, and and unpleasant uh, on a on a day to day basis. Uh, and that she's ready for it. Um, she, I will say, I mean, has shown thus far, uh, you know, a, a pretty tough, thick skin. She has not gotten rattled or, uh, you know, nasty herself in public uh, for many, many months now. Uh, and if she is able to, to keep that up, I think, you know, from the Clinton's uh, world's perspective, then they'll call that a success. But she'll be practicing. <laughs> now, Daily. Now yeah. the imperative is on her to practice. <laughs> her move. Well, she's had a little practice. That's you know, true. The last over, years, yeah, exactly. Fair enough. And here, thanks. Thank uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some of Trump's new commercial real estate. And if you're watching us here in Washington, D.C., you can now listen to us on the radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. Clinton's America, the system stays rigged against Americans. Syrian refugees flood in. Illegal immigrants convicted of committing crimes get to stay, collecting Social Security benefits, skipping the line. Our border open, it's more of the same, but worse. Donald Trump's America is secure. Terrorist and dangerous criminals kept out. The border secure, our families safe. Change that makes America safe again. Donald Trump for president. That was Donald Trump's first general election TV ad, which will be airing in four key battleground states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Florida, over the next 10 days. Joining us now to talk about this is new ad, is new ad buyer Ken Goldstein, our Bloomberg Politics ad and polling analyst, and a professor at the, of politics at the University of San Francisco. Ken, what are your thoughts on the ad? 
Well, you know, as I was watching it here, um, you know, lots of pundits and certainly like my colleagues in political science will look at an ad and try and workshop it. And what's the secret code? What's the dog whistle? There's no dog whistle on this. It's just a big, loud train whistle. You know, it's very obvious. Here's lots of immigrants, Mexicans pouring over the border. Here's helicopters and border guards guarding in the Americans. So, you know, we don't have to sort of go inside the actor's studio to figure out what's going on here. Very clear, pound you over the head message. No, no semiotics here. Well, is this a big ad buy? Well, it actually is not a big ad buy. We're going to talk about it. I'm sure lots of our other colleagues in the media are talking about it. But it's actually one-fourth the size of just Hillary Clinton's ad buy over the next 10 days, not to mention that the Clinton campaign and Priorities USA, her super PAC, have already spent $150 million this summer. So it's $5 million versus 18 or 19 million this week versus 150 million for the summer. Yeah, but can, how much does the Trump campaign really even need to worry about ad spending on an ad like this, or really any ad they come up with? Aren't they just going to get a ton of free media play? Exactly. We'll, we'll all get a thank you note. Uh, it, <laughs> I, what do you think we're going to be talking about in 10 days? We're going to be talking about this spot. If they do any other spots, you know, quick, name me three Hillary Clinton spots. You can't, you can't yeah. think of them. There's $18 million of them. We're going to be talking about this spot, and he's going to generate so much in free media from this. Okay. Well, let's look at the Clinton campaign's ad spending, where and how much she's spending, and what it tells us. So um, Pennsylvania is on the board, uh, as is um, uh, Ohio and Florida and Nevada. But what's interesting to me is the states that are not on the board for, for Clinton, and then we're on the board for, for Trump either, which is Colorado and Virginia. So we can sit here and we're nerds, right, and figure out what's a battleground and what's not a battleground. So what we know now is Colorado and Virginia are not battlegrounds because Trump's not airing ads there and Clinton's not airing ads there. So she's still up pretty heavy in, in Pennsylvania. Um, we'll see if she stays up heavy in Pennsylvania, but for now, Colorado and Virginia off the board. And uh, when do we expect the next ad from Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I am done and retired from the predicting what Trump, what Trump will do game, and certainly when it comes, comes to advertising. You know, I understand there was a bit of a, a you know, battle within the Trump campaign about what their first creative would be. Um, you know, and given sort of the previous conversation you've had here about the, once again, a changing of the guard uh, in the Trump campaign, I would not expect any less aggressive advertising whenever that spot comes. No, it certainly didn't seem much different from what Trump has been talking about. Ken Goldstein thank you up next we'll take the show global when we come back
Clinton wants to be America's Angela Merkel. By the way, for the price of supporting one refugee in the United States, we could support 12 in a safe zone in the Middle East or, let's say, Syria. The improved refugee screening standards I have proposed will save countless billions of dollars. It's called extreme vetting. Extreme vetting. Welcome back. That was Donald Trump at his rally just a few minutes ago in Michigan. We're joined now by Tom Rogan, a contributor for the National Review and a senior contributor to Opportunity Lives. Tom, thanks for being here. Good to be with you. Thank you. Wow. I mean, so much to talk about, but let's start with two things real quick. In the foreign policy world, image of the Syrian boy. Mm. How does this play in the context of the election? Does this make Americans more sympathetic to the plight of Syrian, Syrian refugees, or does this give Donald Trump ammunition? I think in the political level, ultimately, the Syrian refugees is something that will help Trump. The counterpoint, though, to that is that, to some degree, it represents an indictment of the president's foreign policy in the sense of Aleppo, in the sense of Russian deliberate action there. So it's going to be interesting how it plays out. I think when you get to November, again, you just in the previous segment talking about those hammering ads, talking about, you know, again, the, the notion of immigration uncontrolled. But at this immediate moment, pulls at the heartstrings in an obvious way. I think most Americans would say, and, and the critical issue here will be, can Hillary Clinton, I think, develop a refugee strategy that addresses women and children specifically? If you do that, I think she can really kind of win that center ground from Trump because people, you, the image speaks for itself in terms of how horrific it is. The other big foreign policy challenge this week for President Obama, and perhaps by extension Hillary Clinton, is this new sort of tantalizing revelation of the plane leaving Geneva with $400 million on it. Uh, it couldn't take off or land until the, um, you know, uh, Americans had been released from Iran as part of the deal. Uh, Republicans are seizing on this to call this exchange, the whole process, ransom, a ransom payment. Um, does this take hold? Do you think most Americans care, or do you think they've written off the Iran nuclear deal as something too complicated to understand? And does it stick to Hillary? I think it, it creates some damage to Hillary. But the great and one of the interesting things is that the, the great strength Hillary Clinton functionally has is that the Republican establishment on foreign policy, as much as there are the people who've come out visibly, are behind the scenes. There is a great deal more people who, quite frankly, are more predisposed towards Mrs. Clinton than they are Donald Trump. It's, it, it is a fact, and so. As much as, yes, there could be concerns if there was a different candidate, because of Donald Trump's prospective weaknesses with a lot of Republicans, I think he loses some of that opportunity to use that, uh, where otherwise it would be very powerful notion of a big ransom payment to a, a state sponsor of terror. And on the, on the topic of, of Donald Trump's potential weaknesses, the other big story today, obviously, is the departure of Paul Manafort. Mm -hmm. And we know from Eric Trump and from our own reporting inside the campaign that a lot of that really was driven by Manafort's uh, in, increasingly uh, politically dangerous, I think, ties uh, to the former Ukrainian government. Can you explain to me why the AP revelations that came out yesterday were so serious about Paul Manafort and what he had actually done lobbying-wise in the United States? I think for a couple of reasons, because ultimately, well, the first key reason is the connectivity between what he was doing and the Russian government. Well, and it, it, tell us what, it, what, it, what this revealed. I mean, what, what did it show that he was doing? Well, it, it showed that he was essentially in very lucrative uh, engagement with the Russian government through the Ukrainians. I mean, this is the, the fact. And you've, if, you've, if you delve into the details of Russian organized crime, the synergy from the Kremlin, Putin, uh, it, that it becomes very, very, basically more stuff will come out. I think that's, that's the takeaway. They knew that. They knew they had to get ahead of it. Quite frankly, I don't understand how they were, it does show to some degree the amateurness of the, of the campaign that they didn't strike this off the ground. But, you know, Manafort is known for being an old lobbying hand, and it sounds like he didn't even have the proper registration with the federal government in order to be conducted 
conducting this sort of thing. So what, what exactly should he have done if he were engaged in this kind of activity? Well, that he number one, he should not have joined the Trump campaign because he should have known this was going to come out. Uh, it was that obvious. And, and also, this is stuff that U.S. intelligence follows, right? That, that at some point, this would probably have leaked. At some point, you know, I wonder what the FBI is looking in their simulation. The fact that he wasn't even registered. Yeah, and, and because of that foreign intel, it's not just about, you know, corrupt practices, block foreign government, it's because of the synergy with the Russian government. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the old school Cold War that never ended the collection efforts by the US and the NSA, you know, CIA. It, 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 it's stuff that does not, he, I don't know how someone is, who's been in the business as long as he has been in, thought that he could play this one. What, yeah. do you, what do you make of the sort of idea that Trump is an unwitting agent uh, of the Russians? Do you think he's demonstrated that? And do you think that, um, that losing Manafort helps him to shake that perception, or does he have kind of another hurdle no, he, even without not, He won't be able to shake it, because the, the, the business links, again, that, quite frankly, haven't come out. John Schindler, a friend of mine, uh, who is not by any means a Clinton uh, supported writing at The Observer, a lot of you know, in-depth stuff about the, the Trump campaign and the concerns on that U.S. intelligence side. And, and again, Trump's difficulty here, I think, is that because he has said so many things about Putin, because the Russians are clearly on his side, uh, and it, it's very visible that it's an orchestrated campaign right from the top. The Russian equivalent of the NSA is run under Putin's direct office. <laughs> so there is a degree of control from the top uh, in terms of, again, the, these hacks through WikiLeaks, which is the Russians, uh, that, that you know he is, that they want him there. And functionally, I think he does like Putin and, and his agree, you know, that, that self-confidence that he has, uh, I don't think he's going to back away from it. And I, it gives, it is going to, you know, the Clinton campaign, again, what we just talked about with the Republican establishment concerned about Russia, he, he's dancing in a minefield here and the Clinton campaign from the sidelines, I think, are enjoying it because it weakens him with core constituencies on the conservative right that, quite frankly, really do not like Clinton. Talk about this a little bit more uh, in terms of the WikiLeaks and, and the connections to Russia. Do you have a sense of how most American voters, potentially, especially voters in the middle, kind of feel about WikiLeaks as a phenomenon and how that might shape um, their voting proclivities? Yeah, I, I, look, we talk about it more than perhaps people are concerned about those core issues. I think that's why that Trump ad was a good was a good ad in terms of smashing people over the head, in terms of uh, generating concern about particular issues. The problem he has, though, is that below the surface, again, the connection point with Russian foreign policy, ultimately the ideals of that center ground, uh, Virginia Beach, for example, would be another, you know, the, the military communities serving the country, ideals, democracy, uh, you know, the different, the Aleppo boy, where the Russians are very heavily engaged, deliberately killing people to build pressure, I mean deliberately. Uh, when people start seeing that, if those connection points are drawn, which they will be because they should be, uh, it, it, then it becomes a problem for him. Because Trump, Trump is not the only one, right, who has to deal with uh, concerns from the Russians. You mentioned, you mentioned WikiLeaks. You know, we've already seen the damage uh, that these leaked emails have done politically, costing Democratic National Chairwoman uh, Debbie Wasserman yep. Schultz her position. And the expectation is that there's a lot more to come and that the Russians or the hackers or whoever are holding them mm -hmm. until after Labor Day, until the fall, yeah. and at that point could reveal things that are uh, yeah. deeply inconvenient or worse for Hillary Clinton. I, I think so. The, the question, because, and I suspect they do have stuff, I suspect they have stuff from the server, but because of the lack of safeguards and because of how aggressive and capable the Russian collection agencies are, especially in signals, they, they probably do have stuff. The question is how bad is it? And, and also the question, because if Trump, if, this, if that polling gap that has developed in the last couple of weeks sustains, I wonder whether the Russians actually wouldn't, you know, they might retain it, and, and if they really have something, hold it over after the election. Of course, the whole point is that we're dealing in a world of hypotheticals, but if the Russians have, they want Trump, if they think it can have utility towards electing Trump, they will use it. If they think that it's a lost cause, if they think it, it's a Wasserman Schultz type stuff or something that embarrasses Clinton, but kind of you know, generates a couple of weeks, that they won't use it. It's, it's, it's intelligence behind the scenes. In more than any other election in you know, uh, recent years, uh, there's, a, there's the, the great uh, intelligence game is operating in the backdrop. So we will see what happens. Real quick, do you think that we will see any Republican former secretaries of state or sort of Republican luminaries who have not already come out? Uh, now stand in favor of Hillary Clinton in order to fend this sort of thing off? Uh, I, I think, yes, I do. Uh, and I think, because I think Trump will continue on what he's doing, and you've seen this with, with the campaign changes, that, that's an endorsement of self. Uh, 
people like Bob Gates, former defense secretary, that archetypal Republican realist establishment, not just neocon, that, that's, that I think is what's that's gonna come what's next. To okay, yeah. Tom Rogan, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back. Head to BloombergPolitics.com right now for all the latest on the election, including our decoding of the complicated web of Trump world. And coming up next on Bloomberg TV, Emily Chang's exclusive interview with Hugo Barra. Till
I'm Ramian Asensio, and you're watching Bloomberg West. Let's start with a check of your first word news. First, our President Obama is now heading to flood ravaged Louisiana on Tuesday. At least 13 people have died from the floods, and the president has been criticized for not wrapping his vacation up sooner to visit with those victims. White House says he wants to ensure that his presence does not interfere with ongoing recovery efforts. An Obama administration admission that a $400 million cash payment to Iran was contingent on the release of a group of American prisoners is now being slammed by GOP lawmakers. Thursday's explanation was the first time the U.S. had definitively linked the two events. House Speaker Paul Ryan accused the president of misleading the public while Donald Trump says Obama, quote, openly and blatantly lied about the exchange. Meantime, Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort has stepped down. The unexpected resignation comes after the campaign announced a major shakeup on Wednesday, its second leadership reshuffle in two months. Manafort had also come under increasing media scrutiny because of his past consulting for the pro-Russian former president of Ukraine. Trump said in a statement he accepted the resignation. And the death toll from the terror attack in the French resort town of Nice is now 86. Authorities say the latest victim had been at a hospital and died from injuries sustained during the July 14th massacre. He's the second hospitalized person to die since the attack. Dozens more were injured when a Tunisian living in France drove a truck into a crowd of people celebrating Bastille Day. Islamic State claimed responsibility. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rami Asensio. A disappointment in court for Uber after a California judge rejects a settlement with drivers. Does it open the door to a trial? Are there any silver linings? We will discuss. Plus, it could be the biggest leak at the NSA since the 2013 revelations of Edward Snowden. We'll introduce you to the shadow brokers. And signs that Xiaomi's grip on the Chinese smartphone market is slipping. We'll hear from Vice President of Global Operations Hugo Barra about the company's outlook at home and abroad. But first, to our lead. Ride-hailing startups back in the news as Lyft fails to find a buyer. This according to the New York Times. Lyft is said to have approached several parties about a sale. Apple, Google, Amazon, Uber, and Didi. Although the most serious conversations happened with General Motors. While the company is in an immediate danger of closing, one source said the company is unprofitable but has a cash cushion of $1.4 billion. This news comes after a separate report from the information suggested Lyft had rebuffed a takeover offer from GM. I'm here with Bloomberg's global head of technology, Brad Stone, as well as Joel Rosenblatt from our legal team. So, Brad, I want to start with you on the Lyft story. What is your analysis of, of Lyft trying and failing to sell itself sure, to a, yeah, no, to a lot a, of different companies, including its arch rival. Not a, not a great report for Lyft. Uh, but look, it's been a great month for Uber, right? They did the deal in China with Didi. Uh, this week they announced, and, and, and we had the, the first story about the rollout of their autonomous vehicle program in Pittsburgh. And look, Lyft is challenged. There's a lot of ambiguity around its business. You know, can it be a profitable number two in the United States? What does this market look like when the companies have to get to profitability, where they can stop sinking money into the discounts for drivers and riders? And so it's not surprising that with all this ambiguity, uncertainty around the real strength of the business, that buyers would be a little hesitant right now. And that's not to say there won't be interest for Lyft down the road, uh, but there are just significant questions about the health of its business. And Lyft did have a global alliance with Didi in some of the Does other still ride exist? hailers. It's exactly. Another great so what point. are the implications? Well, it's a great point of, of uncertainty. Like, Didi just did a deal with Uber. And yeah, the Didi CEO, uh, Cheng Wei, now sits on Uber's board. And they just spent six months trumpeting an alliance between Grab Taxi and Ola and Didi and Lyft. So, you know, lo lots of questions about whether Lyft still, whether that alliance is still in play and whether it can have an impact on the business. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about this lawsuit. We, we, we got this news yesterday, but we're still trying to digest what this actually means for Uber. So a judge, Joel, has rejected a $100 million settlement that Uber struck with drivers over a class action suit in California. How big a blow is this to Uber? You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a blow because, in fact, there's some indications to me that um, Uber was agitating for this to happen. The reason it's not a blow is because after they made the settlement, the Ninth Circuit agreed to hear Uber's arguments that its arbitration clause should apply to its drivers. So now they can bet 
on this ruling that seems to be forthcoming. We'll see. It's not a sure thing, but they're betting that the Ninth Circuit is going to uphold its arbitration clause, pushing all these drivers into private one-on-one -on -one arbitrations and decimating this class action. So. Well, let me, ahead, yeah, let me let me add to that. I mean, the big kind of legal story here, as I understand it, is you know is this is this probably decades long, uh, you know, a trend in the U.S. courts to limit the rights of workers to organize and sue companies as part of class actions. And what companies have been doing is establishing arbitration clauses with not only employees but also customers, and saying if you have a